seated and as we open up in our Bibles to Mark chapter 11 verse 29 as we continue our study through the book of Mark and you know today is communion Sunday so we'll be concluding with a time of communion and I just want to emphasize that for the believers here to and we're just going to be the emphasis this time is to uh, have that deep relationship with them to just see if there's something in our life that we need to just get rid of to to just have uh, sacrifice at the cross of Jesus something that we know is hindering us from a, a greater walk with him last week we saw that Jesus cursed the fig tree and talked about forgiveness and uh, the importance of forgiveness and I think because he was going to the cross to show the power of forgiveness because he forgives us because he went to the cross for our sins and and now the Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus and the first question was what authority he had to do the things that he was doing and they're gonna have further traps this week but in Mark chapter 11 verse 29 uh, where the chief priests and the elders have come to trap him. So this is the heavy hitters. This is the high priest, the second in command of the high priest, the chief priests, the elders that ruled the tribes of Israel, and the scribes, who are the ones that write the Bible and that were respected. They copied the Bible. They didn't write it, but they were respected in the society because they were the ones that gave the Bible, just like we prayed for the people going to China. Uh, you know, they're bringing the Bibles. That the ones that brought the Word of God to the people, to the synagogues around Israel, were important. And they were the ones testing Jesus, saying, What authority do you have? And Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one question, then answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven... He will say, why then did you not believe him? Believe in John the Baptist and his message to repent and to turn to Jesus and have faith in him and to believe in him. Why, did, why didn't you do that if you knew that was from God? Uh, but if we say from men, they feared the people for all counted John to have been a prophet from God, parenthetically, indeed. So they answered and said to Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus answered and said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And we concluded our study last week with that section of scripture. And the, but it's just as applicable today. People say, well, you know, I don't have to give my life to Jesus. What, what authority does he have to take charge of my life? Uh, what authority does his word have, talking about the creation in six literal days, not that many years ago? What authority does the word of God have to tell, to define marriage? What authority does he have to say uh, in all these thou shalt nots and thou shalts? What who gives him the authority? The fact he's God, that's what gives him the authority. And, and we just have to recognize that when people say, well, yeah, they come to us with all these questions, because he's God and because you're not. And see, the, the people can think in their mind. See, these guys knew what the word of God said, but they're not letting God be God. They're not letting Jesus be the Messiah sent from big God because he's messing with their plan for their power over the people, and they won't accept it and once again it's many times people miss heaven by 12 inches they know it in their head but they refuse to let it come into their heart to set them free from their own arrogance and pride against God uh, to let God rule over their lives let's turn to Isaiah chapter 5 verse 1 because the next section of scripture in chapter 12 verse 1 Jesus starts to give a parable to these scribes and Pharisees and elders of the people he gives a parable in the hearing of all the other people that's a rebuke to these guys. He rebukes them, and he's actually rebuking them in the same way that 700 years earlier, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, was inspired by God to rebuke his Jewish generation in Israel before their destruction by the Assyrians and the, and the Babylonians. So in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1, it says... Uh, and he's really kind of Isaiah's being a prophet, speaking the words of God to the people. Now let me sing to my well-beloved. Now, your Bibles have well-beloved capitalized. And, and I think partially because it's talking about an actual person, person, place, or thing, <laughs> capitalized. And the other thing is we're going to find out that Jesus uses beloved to himself in Mark chapter 12. 
So really, you can say in here, you can put into your Bibles, now let me sing to my well-beloved, and parenthetically, Jesus, because that's who Jesus says is what's being talked about here in Mark chapter 12. A song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. And we're going to find out that Jesus, he has a vineyard. He, he wanted the Jewish people to be his witness people. He is my beloved. Is he your beloved? Can you say that Jesus is my beloved? If you're a believer here today, you can. If you're not a believer, who is your beloved? And how long is that beloved relationship going to last? It's only going to last till you die. I'm so glad I have a beloved that lasts forever. I love my beloved here on this life, my wife Juanita. Uh, but I'm most impressed with the, my beloved Jesus who died on the cross for my sins, and I get to have a relationship with him forever and ever. Uh, so the well-beloved has this vineyard on a very fruitful hill. The, the soil is ready for a vineyard. He dug it up and cleared out its stones, planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. He himself did everything to produce good grapes. He built the wine press. I'm going to get a crop of, of grapes and grape juice and wine. He had it all ready except for wild grapes grew up. And now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem, Isaiah is saying, and men of Judah, judge. Please, between me and my vineyard, what, could, what more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? So, really, Jesus is saying, look at all that I did. I brought them from Egypt, parted the Red Sea, gave them water, gave them manna, gave them protection, cloud by day, fire by night, all the history of the time, you read Joshua and Judges and 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, up to this point in history and of Isaiah, and all they got it, all the merciful times he had overlooked their sins, their idolatry, their rebellion, and everything, and now it's coming towards judgment time, and he basically says, what more could I have done? This is a good question to ask people. I don't believe in Jesus. What more does God have to do to save you from sin. What, what more could he do to save you from sin? And, and what God is saying, just judge. Judge between my vineyard, the people I'm trying to save, and me. I have done everything to try and save you, is what God's saying. But the vineyard wants to be wild. I chose to go from a wild <laughs> grape to a submissive, loving Jesus grape. And I recommend that everybody here, if you haven't done it, does it too. Uh, today would be a great day to change. Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the, its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. I shall not be, it shall not be pruned or dug. But there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. And so he's saying, I, I birthed Israel. They were supposed to be a witness to the world of loving Yahweh, the true God, fleeing from idols, fleeing from idolatry and immorality and all these other things. Well, if you read the rest of Isaiah, in his generation, the nation of Israel was going after everything other than God, worshiping idols, worshiping the queen of heaven, uh, uh, burning their children in the fire, killing their children, doing all these things. And what God is saying, I'm going to destroy you. There's going to be a time of your conquering destruction. Now, it's important to realize that the scribes and Pharisees and elders of Jesus' day were very familiar with Isaiah chapter 5. That, that was their kindergarten class was the book of Isaiah, and they knew it. Now, let's go back to Mark chapter 12, verse 1. By the way, the king, the Bible doesn't say this, but Jewish history has it that the very evil, wicked king Manasseh, wicked king of Judah, Manasseh, was so fed up with this negative message from Isaiah 
that he put out the word he was going to kill Isaiah. And Isaiah found himself a tree to live inside of. And uh, Manasseh found out about it and said, ah, don't worry about getting him out of however he was locked in there and just saw the tree down. And so they just sawed through where Isaiah was and sawed him in half. And so, so now, and that's important because the Jews knew that. And Jesus is now going to say the same thing, knowing that in a couple days, the rulers of his day are going to so hate his negative message that they put him on the cross uh, by divine plan, because if Jesus doesn't go to the cross, then we're all lost in sin. So we're glad it happened, but it's still, Jesus said, offenses must come for the plan of God to be worked out, but woe to him whom, by whom the offense comes. So in chapter 12, verse 1 of Mark, it says, then he began to speak to them in parables. The, again, the chief priests, the chief uh, priests and elders and scribes, a man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, which is to protect it, dug a place for the wine vat, expecting a harvest, built a tower, and the towers in the vineyard would, a, a watcher of the vineyard would crawl up in the tower and watch all day for any animals or things that were happening that were stealing the grapes and causing any damage or any thieves. So watching over, he built a tower to watch over the, the harvest of the grapes. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now the vine dressers, the leasing to the vine dressers, who are those leases? They are the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders. I am putting you men in charge. You, you the chief priests or the Levites, and God had told Aaron, the first chief priest, the first high priest, you and your descendants' responsibility is not even to have property in the land of Israel. You alone are not to, allow, to be inheriting any land because your mission is to keep teaching these people the word of God. That's their mission. And so he, God put them, he leased them to watch over the flock to provide, to make sure that it was fruitful, uh, grapes being the nation of Israel. Now, at vintage time, when God should have been seeing them being a witness people and the nations around them, we love your God, your God is so good, we're going to leave our country and come and worship in Israel, worship the true God, leave our idols. At vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. No fruit for God. And, and really what God is saying, I sent prophets. I said, okay, you know, here's what you need to do. You've been in sin. You haven't been allowing the, the crop to truly produce the vines. And the people said, get out of here. And they beat up the servant of God. Again, he sent them another servant. And at end, at him, they threw stones, wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully treated. Again, prophets. They beat the prophets. That You can read the Old Testament. They hated them. They, they gave them a negative message. They threw them in jail. They um, stoned them, whatever they needed to do to get rid of the message. And again, he sent another. And him they killed, and many others beating some and killing some. As I said, they killed Isaiah. They tried to kill Jeremiah. At the end of him uh, spending 20-some years warning them to turn away from their sins and to turn to God, the king put him in a cistern, dropped him into a muddy cistern at the bottom, and was going to leave him there for dead. Uh, and you know the, the eunuch of the king says, King, you can't take a prophet of God and kill him in the cistern. Let me, let me go get some, you know, some sheets so that we can drop it down as a rope so that we can put it around his chest. He's 80-some years old, and we can pull this old man out of there instead of letting a prophet of God die in a cistern. And so they got him out. They hated Ezekiel. They hated the other prophets. When we read these prophets of the Old Testament, they're, they're a blessing to us of knowing what God has said. But to them and their generation, their day, they hated him. The people hated him because they testified to the people that their deeds were evil and when they rebelled against God. And Jesus told his own brothers, he goes, you go to the feast. I know that you hate me. And he goes, they, the world hates me because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. And we have the same thing today. And growing, by the way, they, doesn't the world just hate our Jesus? 
They, they hate our Jesus, because why? Because our Jesus has an opinion about their life, and about the life of the country, and about where we're headed. He has an opinion, but you know, it's really, I love the opinion of a know-it-all, don't you? I love the know-it-all opinion. That happens to be God's opinion, because he knows it all. And we ought to just take, most people like to get the opinion of people that know what they're doing. You know, go, go ask a contractor whether he wants to get the opinion of, of somebody that doesn't know a thing about building a house. And say, oh, I don't want you to get an expert to get on how to, you know, build my house. Go talk to somebody that doesn't know anything about building. And they go, what are you talking about? I want to get somebody knowledgeable. And yet people run to gurus and book writers and people that are not God, that, re, that are contrary to the teachings of God, and they won't run to the Bible who knows everything about you. And everything about your soul. Everything about where you're headed, your likes, your dislikes, he knows, and he, he's got an opinion about the way you think. He has an opinion about what you do. And his opinion is good for you. But when we submit to his opinion, we're laying our lives down at his feet and saying, you know what, I want you to rule my life. And I've already messed up and violated what you said, but you're willing to forgive me, and I, I want to love a God. I want to love somebody that's willing to forgive me for my foolishness, and, and I can follow your opinion to the best of my ability as he gives his Holy Spirit to us to do so. So, then it says, therefore, still having one son, his beloved, now see the his beloved there? <laughs> this is right to Isaiah chapter 5. He, it, this is all Isaiah chapter 5, a little bit more embellishment that Jesus has done here, but it's, it's nearly identical to Isaiah chapter 5. And he says, therefore, still having one son, his beloved, Isaiah, he was, he's telling the scribes and Pharisees, that beloved that Isaiah was talking about, he's saying, is me. That beloved capitalized in Isaiah 5 is me. Therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them last, saying, they will respect my son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Um, Jesus is prophesying what's going to happen, what they're going to do to him in two days. And they know what they're planning on doing. They know, Isaiah, they know what happened with Isaiah. They know that they've already said, and we see it in the other gospel accounts, Jesus must die in order to keep the, country, the nation of Israel from Roman destruction. In other words, they were saying, these people are ours. They're not God's. See, this is, this is so critical back then. The scribes and the Pharisees looked at the people as if they were there to serve them and do their bidding, instead of what God had ordained the priests to do, which is to recognize the people belong to God and to make sure that they tell the people what God has said. Does the same thing happen in the church today, in the pastors in church today? I want you to know I recognize you guys don't belong to me. <laughs> I, I want you to understand that I'm not trying to manipulate you for my benefit or for Calvary Church of Port Orchard's benefit. I am here to tell you that you belong to Jesus. Whether you're saved or not saved, you actually belong to Jesus. It's just that he doesn't demand that you be his. And on the day that you die, he sits there and he goes, okay, you were mine, I made a way for you to be saved, but you rejected, you did not want to be mine, and so I'm not gonna force you to be mine. I will now relinquish my call over your life. But see, all of us, are, we owe our very breath to God. Our next heartbeat comes from God. What he has commanded us to do is the great wisdom of the creator of the universe telling us what to do. And for us to rebel against any of that is utter foolishness. So, therefore, then he goes on to say, therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do, God the Father, when they kill his son that he sent at the very last? What is the owner of the vineyard going to do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Well, was that fulfilled? Yes. 
the, the high priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the elders of the nation of Israel were all wiped out in 70 AD when the Romans came and conquered them. And who did he give the vine dressers to? You know, the, the people that God wants to have as a witness people, as, a, as bearing grapes to God. Where, where are they? Well, they're you, who are the vine dressers. The people that have, for all these 2,000 years, have communicated the gospel of Jesus Christ from generation to generation to generation, so each generation can hear, I can go to the cross and be saved by Jesus. They're the vine dressers that God has, has changed. The dispensation has changed. Now many people will say that Jesus' words right there just confirm the Jews of today, they're gone. They, they, they're out of covenant. They, they have no place in the plan of God. The fact that the Jews are living in the land of Israel today is just a fluke of history that was created by, by you know, misunderstanding people and they, they should be banished from the land of Israel. And again, as I mentioned before, that is twisting other scriptures. Read Romans chapter 9, 10, 11. God put them off to the side. He did judge them. They were wiped out in 70 AD. They were scattered through the nations of the world. But God himself kept their identity for 2,000 years without a homeland. And God himself, in accordance with the promises he made in several places in the Old Testament, brought them back into the land. And by the fact that they're there, and the fact that the Bible talks about them coming there in the last days, shows that we are in the last days. We are getting close to the end plan of God. And just like the Jews, as I mentioned last week, just like the Jews were apostatized and God dealt with them, if the church apostatizes, goes away from the gospel of Jesus Christ, is no longer a witness for him, then we are going to be pushed off and the Jews are going to be front and center again. And we are. The, the church is apostatizing. And uh, we don't want to be part of that. <laughs> Keep preaching Jesus. Even this, you know, Jeremy talked to the coach, Joe, uh, for 30 minutes this week, and he wrote up a thing on Facebook, and I, I got, man, I came back from Denver, and it was like, whoa, <laughs> what's all this hoopla? So I missed a lot of the hoopla. I don't want to say too much about it, except what Jeremy was talking to me. He goes, in what name do you pray out there on the field? And he goes, you know what? Of all the discussions I've had, you're the first person that's asked me that question. Don't you think that's an important question to ask? And he said, I, I make it generic. There's so many different students. They have different beliefs. So I just, I just do it generic in, in your name, and I let people fill in, the, fill in the blank. So, um, you know, and Jeremy said that's in the conversation, and he, he wrote it. So even though it'd be nice for us as Christians to be able to continue to have our constitutional rights, um, constitutional rights are... Even the founder said, if we don't have a God-fearing people, the, what we gave you is useless. I'm paraphrasing, but they basically said, what we've given you in this constitutional republic only works for a God-fearing people. And we have lost God-fearing, and so we're going to lose everything else. But, but saints, here's the deal, and we're going to get this, into this a little bit more later on, but everything's in Jesus' name. Um, it's not a generic God. It's not in your name and, hey, all you kids, fill in the blank. Because <laughs> we're, we're basically endorsing, hey, if it's Buddha, that's okay. If it's some Hindu guru, that's okay. If it's, it, it, do we say that? If we say that, we're, what are we doing with the vineyard? What are we, what are we communicating? But they're going to hate me if I say in the name, you know how the world hates the name of Jesus? Yeah, I know how much the world hates the name of Jesus. Doesn't change, it doesn't change the fact that if I'm going to be a true witness person as a church member for Jesus, it's all about Jesus. Otherwise, it's nothing. It's religion. It's, it's, the, it's the fig tree without any figs. It is the vineyard that has wild grapes. Uh, we are called to be pure grapes for Jesus, for the gospel of Jesus till the end. And, you know, one of the other things Jeremy asked was, you know, hey, where's the gospel in this? I've never, there, none of it is about the gospel. It's all about our constitutional right, <laughs> the First Amendment. And once again, I, I love the freedoms we have. I've been warning you for a long time they're going away, and we're seeing it almost every week how they're going away, and it's going to continue to get worse. 
And true persecution is coming. I mean, that's little persecution. I mean, real persecution is coming because the, whole, the masses haven't been communicated the gospel, or, and even the ones that have, they just don't want to hear it because we're at that same time of destruction that came upon Israel in Isaiah chapter, chapter 5. It's coming. And so, verse 13, going to verse 13, uh, you know, they probably didn't feel too good about themselves after Jesus said all that. Um, oh, I'm sorry, not verse 13. Here I go again. I almost messed up, changed the page, and then <laughs> verse 10. After, the, after verse 9, where, therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? Destroy it. You know, going back to Isaiah, which is what he's paralleling. He will come and destroy the, vine, the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Verse 10. Have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now, I want to emphasize that Jesus is rebuking his generation for hating Jesus because they don't know the word of God, and they're, they're supposed to know the word of God. They're the religious leaders. And he's saying, don't you, haven't you read Oh, I would just love it if every single one of you had read the whole Word of God. If you haven't done so, today's a good day to repent. Let's start working on it. In a year, it's pretty easy to get through. And I know people that do it every year, and it doesn't really hurt them at all. Uh, they can do it. I've seen them. It doesn't, you know, the countenance changes. It's just like when Moses would come down from Mount Sinai after meeting with God. It, you know, the, his face shined because he had been with the Word of God. And what I notice is people that really make it a diligent plan to get through the Word of God on a yearly basis, their countenance changes. Not, not some glow, but wow, they're, they're equipped for the ministry. Um, Allison was telling me she was on a plane trip this week too, and she got diverted because God needed her to go talk to a Muslim lady, so <laughs> made for a long day. <laughs> and she was, talk, she was talking to this Muslim lady, and and uh, about the gospel, she was telling me all the, Kevin, I shared this and this and this. And, and once again, I just rejoiced. Oh, praise Jesus that there was a warrior, there was a vineyard, there was a grape that was giving some juice to somebody that was lost. So thankful. And then she called her husband over. The husband got right in her face and was upset and then took his finger and just went like this to her forehead. And she goes, Kevin, what does it mean when Muslims do that? I don't know. <laughs> Probably means I know who you are and I'm going to kill you. <laughs> you know, I don't know what it means. But if any of you do, then let me know so I can get educated. But, uh, so her countenance has changed she, as she's been in the Word of God a lot, uh, much of her life. And her, her family is rejoicing and others have gotten saved. And just, you know, all of you, everybody that's ever sh shared the true gospel, you're, you're like a real grape that's being squished out onto this dying world. But Jesus, he's quoting Psalm 118 that Joel covered a couple of weeks ago. And in Psalm 118, turn there to verse 21. It says, uh, this is from this, and as you're turning there, I'll just reiterate what Joel taught a couple of weeks ago. When Jesus was coming into Jerusalem on what's called the triumphal entry day, riding on a donkey and everybody's so excited, they're singing this song. The Jews sing this song. It's one of the songs they sing as they're coming into Jerusalem to celebrate the feast, and the feast they're coming into Jerusalem for this time is Passover. And they rejoice, just like we have worship time before the study of God's Word. They had worship time before going up to the Temple Mount, and they would sing this. I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. <laughs> Now, now, Jesus is reminding them, hey, you guys, you just sang this. What did that mean? It, why did God put it miraculously by his divine inspiration of David, the psalmist, why did God say the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? You guys are going to reject me as the Messiah, and I'm going to be the chief cornerstone of what God is going to build when he gets done destroying the vineyard. I'm going to build the church. 
And this was the Lord's doing. It is, mar it, it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, which is Hosanna. When the, we sing, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, is what it says in the New Testament on the day he wrote in. But that save now in the Hebrew is Hosanna. Save now, I pray, O Lord, O Lord, I pray. Send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. So with their mouths, they blessed Jesus on the triumphal entry day. Three days later, they're saying, four days later, they're saying, crucify him. Because he didn't fit their plan. Their plan of power. And he's rejected. And so Jesus is reminding them in verse 10, going back to Mark 12, 10. He's reminding them, what do you think that scripture meant? You guys are hating me. You guys are trying to trap me. You guys are saying this stuff, and, well, what does the scripture mean? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And this is what the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Verse 12, and they, chief priests, scribes, and elders, sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them, so they left him and went away. They, they knew he was rebuking them. He was using the scriptures to show that their attitude towards Jesus was wrong, and instead of repenting, they're wanting to kill him. And once again, we run into that all the time with people that we talk to. They can intellectually know the truth about what God's word has said. They can know the history. They can know that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, but they, they just don't care. What they want to do is kill him, get him out of their life. And we grieve and we weep over that attitude. It's so much better to just say, I was wrong, isn't it? You know, do you ever have a hard time when you just know you've had a fight with your wife, your husband, your children, your coworker, whatever, and, and you just know you're wrong? But it's just so hard to say it, isn't it? <laughs> and I, I was convicted this week. There was a, I had a little family spat with a stepbrother-in-law, and uh, you know, we, were, we were working together on, on doing the basement, and he totally misunderstood this conversation with a realtor and stuff and just took all of his tools and took his time and just, and just left. It's like, wow. <laughs> you know, a total misunderstanding. Well, there's a big job to do, and he knows I flew out here to help this, you know, rip this thing out and everything. And, and I, just, I just said, man, I, I, you know, to my dad and, and his mom, I said, I, I'm just not used to people just, I, I, I got offended, I'm going to pick up my toils, toys, go home, suck my thumb, and, and uh, just throw a hissy fit. And I knew right then Jesus was saying, oh yeah, yeah, you're a great witness. <laughs> <laughs> but it was righteous indignation in my mind at the time. And, but the Lord just convicted me, and I, and you know, so later on I said, Eileen, I just want you guys to know. I mean, I was just like, because it was absolutely shocking. It was just over nothing. It was just, it, I'll tell you what. It, it's just like when, when I hear things going on with people's lives, I come home to Juanita and I go, Juanita, I'm so thankful for you. And, and I want to just say that when I was just spending just a little bit of time with totally worldly thinking people, I'm so thankful for you. I'm so, I'm so thankful and hanging around God-fearing people, it's getting bad out there. And I know you guys have to live out there. And, and it was just, and I was just so shocked at what had happened. But, you know, I shouldn't have said that. Forgive me. I mean, I was, that was not a loving thing to, to say and do. And, and I, I say that. I expose myself to that. You might want to leave the church because your pastor is imperfect. But, um, but I say that to encourage you that, Hey, sometimes things come out, and we do things. Be, when you know the Holy Spirit is saying, yeah, that wasn't me, that was, you shouldn't have said that, that don't try and justify with righteous indignation all this other stuff that we can throw around in our mind. Just do what we should do and say, I'm sorry. Just think what would have happened if the scribes and the Pharisees and the elders and, and had just said, you know what, Jesus, you're right. It, it, th that psalm is talking about you. We are wanting to reject you. This is prophecy happening before our eyes. And, and Isaiah 5, and what you just told us, we know what our attitudes were plotting to kill you. We've actually make, made a deal with Judas, and we're going to be betraying you in a little bit. And, and oh, Jesus, what are we doing? Forgive me. Wouldn't that have been nice? That would have been just really nice, especially 
for them because, because they died, and if they stayed in that condition, do you realize they're separated from God for all of eternity just because they wanted to hold on to a little bit of power in their life at the time? So, but then they move on. Then they, chief priests, scribes, and elders, verse 13, sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his word. So, so the chief priests, scribes, and elders, they go away. Ah, we can't kill Jesus right now. The crowd would kill us. So let's go away, and we're going to send the heavy hitters, the Pharisees and the Herodians. The Herodians were Jews siding with Herod, and Herod was half Jewish, and a, mur a ruthless murderer of anybody that was crossing his rule and the Roman Empire rule. And so they want to test him. They, we'll get rid of Jesus using the Romans is their plan. And verse 14, and when they had come, they said to him, teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one, and you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And, and as I've said before when we taught this in the other Gospels, this is such a perfect trap. I mean, if you understand the whole history and the geopolitical situation of the time, this is a perfect trap that there is absolutely no way for him to get out of. If he says, pay taxes, then, then they say he can't be a prophet of God because he just said to pay taxes to the Romans. And if he says, don't pay taxes, they just, Herodians, did you hear that this man just incited a tax re rebellion against Herod and the rest of the Roman government, and then he would have been just taken away, hauled, killed right there by the Romans? I mean, the lawyers, the, the minds would have thought, there is no way Jesus can get out of this. We've got him. We don't have to kill him. We can just let the Romans do it or let the people reject him because he says to pay taxes. And... Um, but you know what? Do you think they actually trapped Jesus? No. You all know the answer. He says, render unto Caesar. But uh, Jesus has great wisdom on the I got you questions, right? You know, that here we had the Republican debate, and everybody was so upset because the, the moderators were asking the I got you questions. Have you ever noticed that the world kind of has their own little flavor of I got you questions about Christianity? And unfortunately, we're not Jesus. We don't have the sum total knowledge of all of creation at our, at our you know, fingertips. And I want to encourage you that I got you questions are coming. If they haven't come to you already, they're coming, and it's bigger and more all the time. And, and the Bible tells us to study to show ourselves approved, a man rightly dividing the word of God that we might have an answer for the hope that's within us. Because Jesus' answer caused, it's going to say, the humble people, the common person, received his words gladly. This whole dialogue that's happening, the people are watching, and they, they fell in love with Jesus. The people that became the church were the humble that realized that this Jesus had an answer. And it's an answer about eternity instead of just the things of this world, not just politics. And uh, one I'm going to throw out, and this is just a pitch for our coming Sunday evening services, because I just ordered yesterday the DVD for dinosaur soft tissue. And one of the highlights of my trip, or actually two of the highlights were my trip to Denver and the trip back, because on the way there, I felt led by the Lord to not watch the evening football game on Sunday evening. And so in the airport waiting for the, for the plane boarding, and so there's a row of chairs right under the TV that were all open. So I got to sprawl out my luggage and everything and sit there. And another guy comes up, and he sits there. And I had been praying, Lord, I want to be able to share the gospel with somebody. So this guy comes up, and after some small talk, he's there for a, he, he's a yoga master. <laughs> he, he was teaching a bunch of yoga people yoga stuff. And we get to talking, have some small talk, and... And then he wanted to continue the conversation, but we're boarding. He's C, I'm A, and it's Southwest Airlines. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you go fly Southwest, you'll know. But, so there's like no way we're going to be able to sit together. But I was saying, Lord, if you want this to happen, then let it happen. So I, I'm boarding. I sit down, and he comes on, and he says, oh, there's, there is. There's still a place open. And I go, yeah, but all the luggage is full. And so he goes, I'll go to the back of the plane, put my luggage there, come back and sit. And for two and a half hours, it, that flight went, bam, just bam, <laughs> uh, just 
and it was just question after question after question, and one of them, and this is the one that I'm going to make important for you to know, too, is, so you're probably one of those that believes the earth is just thousands of years old. The I got you question. So you're one of those, I mean, he didn't say this, but you're one of those idiots that thinks that the earth is only thousands of years old. And, and here's the answer. Here's the answer I want you to be armed with also. And it's a fact and it's the truth. I go, I, actually, I don't believe it. I just know it's true from science. What do you mean? And I said, you know, a few years ago, about 10 years ago, Mary Schweitzer, a paleontologist, and this was on 60 Minutes, you can tell them, this is the 60 Minutes thing, this isn't something I'm just making up. Uh, a paleontologist took a slice of a T-Rex bone, dissolved away the, the bone tissue to just discover, you know, try and learn some knowledge of what's inside, and she starts pulling at a blood vessel. Soft t dinosaur soft tissue is what it's come to be called. And she goes, whoa, how... 60 million years old. Now, see, science knows how quick organ organic materials decay away, even in a fossilized situation of a dinosaur. They know that it can't last more than 100,000 whatever years. And so how could there be soft tissue inside from in the bone marrow area of a T-Rex bone? And so that just lit the world up. I mean, everybody's thinking, well, you know, Mary, what did you find over there? You shouldn't have looked. <laughs> but now that you have, we've got to make a story for this, because that can't be soft tissue. Well, they've done all the peer-reviewed studies. It was soft tissue veins inside the bone marrow. And, well, that's a fluke. That's just one. Let's cut another one. Soft tissue. Another one. Soft tissue. Soft tissue. Soft tissue. Well, well, let's prove that it can't be soft tissue. We'll do a carbon-14 test because carbon-14 cannot exist past 100,000 years, and we're going to prove that there was no carbon-14 in here, so therefore it's got to be over 100,000 years. And so they carbon-14 tested, and they found significant carbon-14, which means that it was only thousands of years old. That's a fluke. That's a contamination. Let's do another one. Carbon-14, carbon-14, carbon-14. So I said, so by science, science says that your 60 million year old dinosaur is only thousands of years old. And so I believe the science, and that happens to coincide with the wisdom of God, which I believed actually for a long time before all that was found out. Because God is always right, man is always wrong. And there was uh, Pepperdine University, my friend Bob Enyart, uh, went to Pepperdine University down in California and gave a complete lecture on this, and his website, kgov.com, has dinosaur, you can go to his kgov.com, type in in the search engine, dinosaur soft tissue, or you can just go to Google and just say dinosaur soft tissue. It's the first hit, it's his website that documents the dozens of peer-reviewed article laying all this out scientifically. So once again, as I've said before, you do not have to Pretend to be stupid, to, hand, to continue to stand on the Word of God as being the truth. The truth of the Word of God. And see, even before we had the science to prove it, we just know it's true. We could have just said, do you really believe this? 1940, do you really believe this? Yes, I believe it, because God has said it. And man can think that they know something more, but I, you know what? Time will tell, and time has a way of determining the truth. And I bet you someday they're going to discover that actually the Bible was the truth and men were the liars, because this is what the Bible says. Let God be true, and every man a liar. And so anyway, we went, we went on from there, and I was, he wanted to take the tracks that I had you know, brought along to stick in all the pukas and bathrooms and everything on the trip, uh, as I do. And he goes, yeah, take them, take them. And we had a neat conversation. Who knows, maybe I'll see him in heaven because, you know, there wasn't a, a decision made, but uh, maybe we'll see him in heaven. And the origin of Earth's radioactivity is also a must, I think, if you're going to go in, send your kids into universities and whatever, then you should also get... Um, Go to creationscience.com, Dr. Walt's book on the origin of Earth's radioactivity, which explains why Earth's radioactivity has the appearance of being millions, billions of years old, when in fact it's not, and it'll explain that. So again, um, they're trapping them. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Verse 15, shall we pay or shall we not pay 
But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Why, why are you testing God? <laughs> Bring me a denarius that I may see it. So they brought it, and he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him, because he got away. We, we had the perfect Jewish lawyer question, and he got away, because Jesus didn't look at things politically in the mindset of the people as if life only consists of whether you're being ruled by the Romans, the Chinese, the Muslims, whatever else in the world today. He said, it all boils down to you either belong to God or you belong to this world. And, and once again, what's he, say, what's he really saying? Render unto God the things that are God's. What things are belong to God? You. <laughs> You are supposed to render yourself to God while you can. And the benefits are really amazing. Then some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him, and they asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. And that's the law in Deuteronomy 25. It's strange to our culture, but it wasn't to their culture where everything was based on the inheritance of property. If a woman married a man, that man has an inheritance within his tribe of a certain piece of property. And if there's no children and, and he dies and she's there, then she loses all the inheritance and there, what happens? And so there was this law to take care of her and uh, now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and dying, he left no offspring, second, third, fourth, you know, and on to seven, and they all died, no children. And now in their lawyer logic, they're saying, verse 23, therefore in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as wife. Now these guys are Sadducees, they don't believe in the resurrection. And what their, their argument is basically saying is, Jesus, if there's no way for them to know who's married to who, there can't be a resurrection. That's her argument. How can there be a resurrection if people won't know who they're married to when they get to heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, are you not therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? Once again, he goes to the scriptures. Oh, I just hope we all fall in love with the scriptures because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God for when they rise, from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Angels don't marry. And this is such a destruction to the Mormon doctrine of being married eternally in heaven. And I, I, last week I had these same notes in here. Here we are at the end of the study today, and I was trying to get to this last week, so that just shows you how much plans go awry. But, and I, and I was realizing, man, I put these quotes in here without telling you, these are Mormons' attempts to twist the scriptures. This is their writing. Because Jesus says emphatically, there's no marriage. And the first paragraph is basically, well, this, he was saying to the Sadducees, you don't get to be married in heaven because you're evil. So all the evil people, they don't get married in heaven because they, they weren't Mormons that had a temple ceremony and had the handshake with the priest through the veil uh, while they were being married in temple worthy married and able to have celestial children later on with their wives that are through eternity when the, when the wife gets to go be God with, with you on another planet. So that's what the first argument is. By the way, we reject that. <laughs> uh, and verse 2, that, well, that's because if you get married here in the Mormon temple, you don't get married in heaven. See, it's all because Jesus was saying you get married here but you don't get married in heaven. Your, your marriage stays eternal that way. And, um, and then the last one is, well, that's because Jesus was just saying it's obvious that the first husband was it because that's the one that was the temple-worthy marriage and all the other ones don't count. And all of that is just foolishness. And it just, I, once again, if you love your Mormon friends, you'll tell them they're following the false teacher, Joseph Smith, who who taught many things contrary to the true prophet, Jesus Christ, who gave us the truth. And um, then verse 26, but concerning the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses, 
in the burning bush passage how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. You know, Exodus 3, 6, and 15. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. See, when, when Moses wrote that, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were before Moses. They had, quote, died. But God is telling Moses, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not dead people, but live people. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. Why? Because they did not know the scriptures and the power of God. And Jesus would say the same thing to anybody here in this room today that hasn't bowed to the knee to Jesus. They'd say, you don't know the scriptures. You don't know the power of God. You are greatly mistaken to reject this God who loves you so much. And uh, we were going to go further, but we're going to have to actually cut it. And I was actually going to do this do the emphasis of what's coming ahead as part of the communion, but I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just leave it with this and say, may God have mercy on, on all, he has had mercy on all of our souls by sending Jesus. We can know him, we can trust him. And what we're gonna remember in communion is only for believers, it's only for those who trust in Jesus as your savior. Because otherwise, why take the bread? Why take the cup if, if it's not in remembrance of what he did for you? And so it's a, no one's going to judge you or think evil of you if, you, if when the elements, there's going to be the guys are going to be coming up and passing the elements out to you. And just take the bread and take the cup and just, and just hold it until we take it together. Um, but I want us to remember what Jesus has done. The what the scripture said and the power of scripture authority to, to remember to lay down our lives, how we have laid down our lives, and what he's wanting us to do is to lay down our lives too. And if there is something, you know, we're, we talked last week about forgiveness. Um, Jesus was asked about the greatest commandment that's going to go on here. And he, hey, it's love God, love, <laughs> love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And today that's been morphed into just a love God, love man without defining what that term is. But Jesus defined the term. He says, if you love me, you'll do what I say. And a lot of us might be doing things that Jesus said not to do, that the word of God says not to do. We don't want to be like the scribes, the Pharisees, even in our Christian walk with him. We don't want to do the things that are contrary to what Jesus has said. We want to love Jesus with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, but we fall short until the day he takes us home. And, and he's working on us by the power of his Holy Spirit. But if there's something that you know, you know that Holy Spirit's talking to you. <laughs> you know, I knew that if I didn't tell my, my stepmom, I'm sorry for what I lipped off with towards you know, your son, um, I would be so convicted. I would have been so convicted until I did it right because the Lord has that Holy Spirit to convict us when we're doing things that are contrary to his way. And so now is a good time. Let's, let's make that our commitment today as you're grabbing the bread and the cup. Maybe you have to say you're sorry to your wife, to your husband, to your children, to your boss, to your coworker, to your neighbor. And you've just been putting it off and you haven't done it because you're, you're wanting to be you. <laughs> you don't want to humble yourself. Well, that was, the guys that did that in the Bible, they, they regretted it. Let's do it Jesus' way and see what Jesus does in our life when we're willing to forgive and to humble ourselves one to another, amen? And so uh, as, as we, uh, I, you know, let's pray, and then I'm gonna uh, sit down and join you in, in grabbing the, the bread and the cup. Father, I just thank you for your word, Lord, that is a lamp to our feet. I pray you would cause all of us here in the midst of our extremely distracting world that we're living in with all the technology and the things and the tantalizations that you would help us to fall more in love with your word. That, Lord, we wouldn't be ignorant of what you say and that we would understand your power to change us and to save us and to save those around us. And, and, uh, and Father, I just pray that you would, by the power of your spirit, minister the hearts of those that are here in this room today to let them know and be convicted of the things that, that need to be made right as we remember what you did to make all things right in dying on the cross for our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Holy God of all creation, you bring life to all who seek your face, yeah. So we lift our hands, our hearts and sweet.
your name in all the earth. Ooh, you're glorious, yeah. Is your name in all the earth. 